although I miss I miss I miss him a lot, um, and you know, and I wish he was here. But the one saving grace is that we had a good time. We, I've got good memories, and and so I think that sustains me. The memories st sustain you um, through the times when you're, you know, when I miss them. I think. Um... Hi guys, TJ. You're at New Zealand Mysteries. That was Agnes Nicholas talking about her late husband Jack, who was murdered in two thousand and four. And uh, she was talking to stuff.co.nz, a reporter there. And we're going to go into the case and have a look into it. This was um, suggested to me by one of our subs, Jonathan. So thank you very much. I genuinely do not want to cause any hurt or offence with my videos. I'm just looking at articles on the internet and um, going over them. My heart wants to keep these stories alive. Uh, especially the unsolved ones like this one someone's gotten away with murder and justice needs to be done and hopefully everyone will look at this and might rattle out some information that's what I hope anyway um, so on the screen you can see Crime Stoppers anonymously it really is anonymous please ring 0800 555 111 if you know anything case suggestions nzmissing at gmail.com and if you, if you can shout me a coffee for $3, buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ Mysteries. And pretty please don't forget to like and subscribe. It is a great way to support the channel. Let's get into it. All this information will be in the description box below for you to see. Let's look quickly at the Hawke's Bay region where we're going to. Hawke's Bay region, which in Māori is called Te Matau Ao Māori, is a local government region of New Zealand on the east coast of the North Island. The region's name derives from Hawke Bay, which was named by Captain James Cook in honour of Admiral Edward Hawke. Okay, and we'll just have a quick look. The region's population is 178,000 as of June 2020. And the Hawke's Bay has 3.5% of New Zealand's population. If we quickly look at this, uh, you can see here. All right. I was really lucky when I went looking for this story that a reporter at stuff.co.nz had done a really extensive look into it. So we're going to be using and going over their article because it's the best information out there. So big shout out to Marty Sharp from stuff.co.nz, June 2019. So I'll have this link in the description box below so you can come and listen to more of Agnes talking about her husband. Let's have a look. The murder of Hawke's Bay farmer Jack Nicholas at the gate of his hill country farm remains unsolved a decade after the acquittal of the man accused of shooting him. Marty Sharp revisits the case for the homicide report and talks to Nicholas's widow Agnes about the memories that sustain her. And I've got a bit of a frog in my throat that just wants to keep coming up so hopefully he'll disappear. Coldness of a morning in the Hawke's Bay Hill Country can surprise those unfamiliar with the area. Heavy mists linger in narrow valleys, thick frost coats, draped fern fronds and bearskin burns in the chilled air. None of this was unfamiliar to Jack Nicholas and on the morning of August 27, 2004, the 71-year-old farmer made a customary walk from his house at the foot of the Kaweka Ranges into that frost. We will never know why he left the house on this particular morning. It may have been to put some more sugary water in the bird feeder, which he liked to keep filled, or because he noticed the gate to his house had been opened, or it may have been because he saw someone in the paddock inside the house. Beside the house, I should say. We won't know because Jack was shot dead within minutes of leaving the house. His wife of 37 years, Agnes, was lying in bed when she heard the three shots, two close together, then a third. It was not uncommon for Jack to shoot rabbits at this hour of the morning, 
if he saw them, and although these shots sounded a little louder than usual, Agnes thought nothing of it. It was a usual morning routine. Jack would get up first, put the kettle on, and bring Agnes a cup of tea in bed. So it sounds like he really loved Agnes. They had a great relationship, a great marriage, and he was a really good husband. And it says this photo here was the last photo of murdered uh, farmer Jack Nicholas taken just days before he was shot. He's pictured reading a Dr. Seuss book to grandchildren Gemma and Jared. This is quite a long episode, so I hope that you can bear with me. At 6.30am, immediately after the shots were fired, Agnes's daughter-in-law, Angelina, who lived with Oliver Nicholas, about 400 metres away, rang her to ask her who had been shooting. She told Angelina it was Jack, who had just left the house. A few minutes later, Agnes got out of bed and made herself that cup of tea. After showering and getting dressed, she noticed four sheep wandering around the garden surrounding the house. She cursed Jack for leaving the gate open, put on a jacket and went outside. There, lying on the hard, cold ground beside the gate was Jack. She could tell he was dead, but checked his pulse all the same. She put a duvet on him. It was obviously very cold. Four years later, she would later tell a courtroom she did this because he looked cold. It was such a cold morning, he looked so vulnerable, she told the High Court jury. Then, in a state of numbness, she called Oliver. Initially, they thought Jack must have had an accident with his gun, but there was no sign of a gun. Agnes called Ollie, then police, at 7.08am. In that triple one call played to the courtroom, Agnes could be heard telling the operator she wondered if Jack had shot himself. Of course, she's not going to be thinking that anyone else has shot him. Um, you know, that's just, why would that happen? I don't know. The gate was open. I'm wondering if he stumbled, but I see some blood at the gate, she said. A half hour later, a helicopter carrying two armed offenders squad members touched down in the paddock beside the house. Jack had left the house sometime between 6am and 6.30am. The shots were fired about 6.30am. Agnes found his body about 20 minutes later. The helicopter landed in the paddock after 8am. So Agnes was pretty quick, man. Whatever, whoever did this was pretty quick. Um, you know, she was out there in good time and didn't see anybody. Now, for our international viewers, a armed offender squad is like a SWAT team, uh, is what you would call them. The minutes that went by between each of these events might have been crucially important to the gunman's getaway and may well be the difference between Jack's murder being a quickly solved tragedy and what it has become, one of the nation's best known unsolved murders. Now, they say that, but I've never heard of it. And um, I guess I'm a crime buff. I know most stories, but obviously there's a lot that I don't. So thank you for the person that suggested it, Jonathan. Jack had been shot in the chest by a high-powered rifle. Two through 308 cartridges found at the foot of a power pole about 40 metres from the house suggested the gunman had leaned against the pole when firing. DNA taken from the cartridges was inconclusive. Police had very little to go on. There was no obvious suspect. There were no obvious signs of how he or she got within shooting distance and away again without being noticed. And no one, least of all Agnes, could think of any reason why someone would want Jack dead. There had been a very heavy frost that morning. Jack was shot, yet police found no footprints or tire tracks that might have led to the killer. That's quite odd. And this is the detective uh, lining up a rifle during tests because this is where they think that the shots were fired from. Now we get to find a little about Jack. So who was Jack? Jack Nicholas could be a gruff man, blunt and bloody minded. He was also a big softy. He played Santa at the local Christmas parties and had a softness for kids, especially his two grandkids and three step grandkids. Jack never smoked, he drank very little, and he never shied from hard work. He was born and raised on a farm near Ashburton by World War I veteran Harold and wife May. 
Jack was the third of nine children. Gosh, some of the families back in those days had so many kids, you know, and I don't know how they would have done it. Uh, he was a man of the land from a young age. He had been a shearer, rabbiter, deer colour, milker and shepherd. His fir he first set eyes on the bit of land that would become his home in the early 50s while doing a bit of rabbiting on a trip to Hawke's Bay to visit his sister. Determined to buy the 938 hectare Makahu station, he returned to the South Island and worked as a deer culler for 18 months, making enough to pay cash to buy the farm in 1953. He broke in much of the land himself, spending long days clearing scrub and gorse, putting up fences and creating paddocks. He lived in a small shack, grew few vegetables and shot the odd wild sheep or deer for meat. Showering was carried out under a waterfall in a stream. What a guy, eh? He knew what he wanted and he was going to get there, that's for sure. In 1963, Jack met Agnes, a Scot who was visiting the country. He fell for her straight away. She wasn't so keen on the idea, but a long-distance courtship through letters saw her agree to return to Makahu to get to know Jack better. By the time she arrived, Jack had beautified the shack and he was clearly resolute in building a life together. Five months later, they were married and a year later they had their first son, Oliver. Second son, Edward, was born three years later. What a cool love story. Jack was outspoken and well-known locally. In 1997, he was fleetingly famous for being the man who introduced the rabbit-killing Khaleesi virus to the North Island. Jack said he'd become frustrated with the government and the nitwit politicians down in Wellington for failing to spread the virus the length of the country. He just sounds like a real down-to-earth good, good bloke. Stubborn ass, but, you know, a good, good guy. So when a farmer in Otago took it upon himself to release the virus himself, Jack followed suit. He had a farmer in Otago send him a flask full of the virus and handed it out to farmers around the region. So a little bit of a rebel too. Um, so this is Jack and Agnes on the day of the wedding in 1963 and uh, the way he's looking at her so adoringly is beautiful. What a beautiful photo. Jack's widow. Agnes, 78, still lives at Makahu. She occupies her time by knitting, sewing dolls clothing for local kindergartens and doing an increasing amount of dog sitting for friends and relatives around the country. As his wife, of course, I'd see him differently to other people. Other people like poachers would think he was a gruff old man, but I didn't think he was a gruff old man. I thought he was kind and accommodating and friendly, she said. Many of the people they met driving on the road through their farm became friends. He was a good family man. He wasn't big on babies, that's true, but I don't know if uh, many, many men are. But when the boys became toddlers, they were always with him. He'd take them around the farm, teaching them things. She says, I think we had a good life, although I miss him a lot and I wish he was here. The one saving grace is that we had a good time and I've got good memories. That sustains me, the memories through the times when I miss him. Jack was cremated. Agnes climbed the highest point in his beloved Kaweka Ranges. Kaweka J and cast his ashes at a point with a view of his farm. Oh, that's so sad and so sweet all at the same time. Makahu is about 90 minutes drive northwest of Napier, about as far as you can drive inland. The farm is unique in that there is a public road, Makahu Road, running right through it to the entrance of the Kaweka Forest Park, where there are natural hot pools and the start of several popular tramping tracks. Wow. Its accessibility comes with the predictable hassles of irresponsible visitors, but the ones who really got to Jack were the rustlers and the cannabis growers. Like other farmers, he was infuriated each time he came across the partly butchered carcass of one of his animals, and he grew weary of anyone crossing his land if they had a gun in the vehicle. And yeah, I can't blame him actually. It would be um, quite daunting having people being able to come on and off your land whenever they wanted and if they're going to be poachers they're going to have guns aren't they and cannabis growers now they can be quite dangerous as well uh not wanting anyone to find their plot so beautiful photo here the investigation jack was killed on a friday morning 
Police closed all roads leading to Pukateri, sorry, Pukateri, after the shooting. The seven pupils of the school were sent home early and locals were warned that a killer could still be on the loose. I apologise for my pronunciation. That was very, very horrible and I am trying to learn how to do it better, um, but I do apologise. A helicopter with heat detecting equipment was used and some 20 police officers made inquiries in the area over the weekend. The late police area commander Kevin Kalf said it was an impossible task to cover every potential escape route. The gunman may have fled by foot or motorbike or four wheel drive and there was a huge area to cover. Over the following days it became clear just how little evidence the police had. Though the nature of the murder and the fact the shooter had escaped without detection suggested it was likely to be someone familiar with the area. And that's what I was sort of thinking as well. I think someone had to know this area very well to be able to get in and out in their very short space of time without being seen or heard um, by Agnes. Jack was a meticulous diary writer and record keeper so police sifted through old records, notebooks and diaries to see if they revealed an incident or grudge that may have led to the shooting. Jack's three farm dogs were kept in a shed near the power pole and they were renowned for barking when strangers came onto the property. Yet Agnes said none of them had barked on the morning Jack was killed. Another red flag. Uh, you know, she would have heard those dogs go off if, if they did. So obviously they didn't. So did they know the person that came on the property? Um, that's what it's sort of saying, isn't it? Police said they could not rule out the fact that Jack knew his killer. Rumours abounded, some believed the scant facts that were public pointed to the killer being Jack's son, Oliver. And that's just speculation, and I don't want any comments below that may hurt the family or anything like that. So please be careful what you say in the comments below afterwards. In early September, police tracked down all 418 hunting permit holders in Hawke's Bay. One of these was a 47-year-old Moana labourer named <coughs> excuse me, Mr Foreman. Asked where he was at the time of the shooting, he said he was at home with his partner, Lissa Fatara, and their son, Shay. That wasn't true. Foreman denied owning any firearms. That also wasn't true. Uh, after this, I'm going to go and um, try and learn how to pronounce these names and places better. Jack's funeral was held at a Taradale church seven days after his death. More than 500 people attended. A breakthrough. The, the Sky Foreman went off the radar till November when police received an anonymous letter claiming he had been telling people he had the weapon that killed Nicholas. Letter writer, Foreman's friend and fellow resident Antoinette Cuttle Coots was identified by fingerprinting. She told police that Foreman had been given the gun by a friend and said she had overheard him telling a friend it was a good job that Jack had been killed and that he recounted an altercation he had had with Jack years earlier. Interesting. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, my computer is just a four gig thing and it doesn't like having heaps of stuff open and me doing this uh, recording stuff. It definitely plays up and that is very annoying. Right, let's go. When police visited Foreman on November the 24th, he repeatedly denied owing any firearms. But when police discovered ammunition in the glove box of his car, he admitted owing three 308 firearms. He took police to his workplace, the Ravensdown fertiliser plant, where he kept a 308 Fabrica de Armas or Amis, and a 308 Bruno. A third rifle, a Remington model 708mm, was found at a friend's house. He was charged in March 2005 and appeared in court on three charges of unlawful possession of firearms and unlawful possession of 17 rounds of Winchester 308 lead tip ammunition. He also faced a joint charge with his friend for the unlawful possession of a Remington 7mm 308 firearm. None of the guns matched the cartridges found at the Nicholas property. 
that was tough. I know nothing about guns. So, um, yeah. So this is Marty Sharp, uh, the reporter we can thank here uh, for all this information. He's done an amazing job, and it is because of him that we are able to get the facts in this case. So big thumbs up to him. A large group of media watched as foreman dressed in a black shirt, jeans and jandals was granted interim name suppression until his next appearance. He said nothing as he walked from court and got into a waiting car. Name suppression was lifted the following month when Foreman pleaded guilty to the charges and was sentenced to 100 hours of community work. Um, this is a great shot of the Nicholas Farm. Absolutely beautiful New Zealand country. Tip-off leads to Foreman's second arrest. In April 2006, Foreman was arrested again. This time on a charge of perverting the course of justice by asking a woman to lie to police. He was arrested at a property as he prepared to go to work. He appeared in Napier District Court dressed in a blue boiler suit. He was granted interim name suppression again. His appearance followed police searches on the, of his property. He used to live on in Grange Road and the nearby Tuki Tuki River and the seizure of two cars. The inquiry team was boosted to 25 officers. It was clear that police had some new and strong information. What they did not reveal was the new information had come via a woman who had contacted the sensible sentencing trust, Garth McVicker. Nicholas had been a founding member and keen supporter of the trust, which was started by McVicker, a fellow Hawke's Bay Hill country farmer. Donna Kingy has lived next door to Foreman. She was also a cousin of Foreman's partner, Lissa. Kingy and Foreman were friends and would chat over coffee and occasional, well, occasionally cannabis. Kingy had made a pre-planned move to Australia three weeks after Nicholas's death. She had become increasingly uneasy about a conversation she had had with Foreman in the morning of Nicholas's death. I would like to call him Jack. Uh, instead of Nicholas's, she contacted McVicker because she had read about the murder on the Trust's website. She and McVicker said she was unaware of the reward that had been offered and she had not referred it into the conversations she had with McVicker over a six-week period at the end of 2005. Detectives flew to Sydney to interview Kingy. She told them about the conversations she had had with Foreman, who she knew by his nickname name Mo, and she agreed to wear a wire and meet him again in a bid to get more information about what he had been doing on the morning Jack was killed. This must have been so hard um, for this, this woman, knowing all this information. It was after these meetings that Kingy wearing the wire had met with Foreman on March the 26th. On May 3rd, 2006, Foreman appeared in court again, this time charged with murdering Jack Nicholas. An interim order for name suppression lapsed three days later and he was publicly identified as the man accused of the shooting 21 months earlier. Trial The eight-week trial before Justice Simon France began on April the 7th, 2008 in a crowded courtroom in the High Court at Napier. Crown Prosecutor Russell Collins opened the Crown case by telling the jurors it was not a CSI case and they should not sit there waiting for a piece of scientific evidence you would feel comfortable relying on to convict. Mm -hmm. The Crown does not have, in this case, the sort of evidence, he told jurors. He said Foreman was angry at Nicholas, I'm sorry my phones are just going off, uh, and refused to allow Foreman and a nine-year-old Shay to cross his land to go on a weekend hunting trip. Kingy repeated the evidence she had given at depositions. She told the court that when Foreman returned from the aborted hunting trip with Shay, he had been swearing profusely about an old farmer who had prevented them from passing through a gate and said the farmer berated him because he had allowed Shay to sit in the car playing with a knife. Well, that sounds really nice, doesn't it? Kingy said Foreman had been on leave the week of the shooting and she had heard his car leave her property late on the night of the 26th. She recounted again that Foreman appeared clammy and pale that morning and that he came up to her and said, I think I just shot someone. 
That's a pretty uh, strong statement, that one. She goes, I said, eh? Bulls, either you did or you didn't, she said, to which he replied, nah, nah, girl, I think I did. The pair sat on the veranda and had a cup of coffee and a few puffs on a cannabis joint she provided. She said he told her he needed to break the gun down. Then he walked to his car, took a firearm from it and put it in his black truck before driving away. So this is the gate where Jack was killed. Kingy told the court that Foreman told her he had been in Pukateri area for a drive on the morning of the shooting and he believed he may have been photographed by someone's security camera. The jury heard the recording of her conversation with Foreman in March 2006 in which she tried to get him to recall the morning of the shooting. Foreman's lawyer, Bruce Squire QC, wasn't buying Kingy's story and put it to her that she had made up a story and had contacted the, the Sensible Sentencing Trust because she wanted the $50,000 reward it was offering. He said she had done pretty well out of concocting the story, which had led police to spend $30,000 on her trips to and from New Zealand and helping her with rent and other expenses. Kingy, then 34, said she had not done well at all and the stress had led her to try and kill herself. Cross-examined by Squire, she admitted that she had used cannabis since the age of 13 and had also used speed and other drugs. So, in your comments down below, because she admits that she takes drugs or she has taken drugs, does that mean she is unreliable and that we can't rely on the things that she said? I'd like to know what you think about that uh, down below. Asked by Squire about her reputation as someone who could speak with the spirits, Kingy said, it was a gift I was born with and that she spoke with spirits in the form of prayer. The trial also heard recordings from a police bug that had been put in Foreman's house in March 2006, in the days following Kingy's visit. The transcript, played to the jury, had Foreman calling Kingy's a uh, shit stirring Maori and saying he was going to slit her throat. Tell her to never move back to here because I'll get her, I'm going to get her, I'm going to get her. Whataro was heard telling Foreman that the police had caught her lying. I said I stayed the night at your place. They called me out lying. You better find a good lawyer. Interesting. Fataro said to Foreman, I'm going to ask you straight up and you better look me in the eye. Did you shoot Jack? Foreman replied, you know damn well I didn't. You and I are a lot closer than that. Of course I didn't. Oliver Nichols, uh, Nicholas, Jack's son, told the court he had been at the kitchen table working on GST forms when the shots were fired. GST guys is just tax. His children had been playing in the hallway. He recalled getting the call from his mother saying there had been an accident involving Jack and then he drove the short distance to his parents house. He said he told Agnes to call triple one then despite being advised they should stay inside he went down the drive to check a bridge and Ford that had to be crossed by any vehicle leaving the area. He said he did this as soon as he realised someone else had been involved in his father's death. He saw no sign of recent vehicle movement, but the sides of the Ford showed evidence of a wash caused by a vehicle driving through it. He estimated the vehicle, <coughs> excuse me, the vehicle. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. He estimated the vehicle probably passed through between 10pm and midnight the previous night. After the helicopter carrying police arrived, he went to move stock. The tensest part of the trial occurred when Squire cross-examined Oliver. By this stage, it was well known that the defence was going to point to Oliver as the possible killer. Collins had, had said as much in his opening. Oliver's feelings towards Squire and what he was about to suggest were clear in his body language and manner on the stand. I couldn't uh, imagine being accused of your father's uh, murder and in trial I think they're just trying to pin it on anybody else but uh, Foreman but we'll see how it goes thanks for still being with me I know it's a long 
case, but it's got so many details. Squire asked why he moved cattle just two hours after his father had been killed and suggested he had done so in order to hide a firearm. Squire said it was an unusual thing to have been well to do when the belief was that there may be a killer on the loose. Was that because you knew there was no danger of being shot, he asked Oliver, who replied, I guess it never entered my head. And nobody knows what they would do in that situation, uh, or how you would react, or anything like that. Foreman's defence included evidence from a pest board eradicator and a truck driver who both said Jack's dogs would always bark when someone went up to the farm driveway. It also called a dog psychologist, Paul Hutton, who said there could only be three reasons for the dogs not to bark. They must have been distracted or unwell, or they must have been familiar with the person they saw. That familiarity level would have to be high. It would have to be very close, very close, if not a family member, he told the court. Collins told Hutton that a police reconstruction of the shooting had seen an officer approach the house without the dogs barking. Hutton said the reconstruction was a bungle. Climatic conditions had been different, the officer had not fired shots as soon as he reached the power pole, and the dogs had reduced sensitivity due to all the activity on the farm after the murder. Foreman did not give evidence in the trial. I actually can't believe they went as far as to get dog psychologists, and I didn't actually know they were a thing and that they could be used in court. Now, this is just a letter. It said, Jack Nicholas's last letter, written seven days before he was shot, was to the editor of a local newspaper. Nicholas had taken umbrage at a column about farming accidents. No sane farmer wishes to hurt him or herself, but farmers' everyday work involves possible injury or, at worst, death. And the worse the weather is, the more chance for things to go wrong. But to live life as it comes entails risks. Otherwise we will become like the USA and totally paranoid and see danger or terror terrorists in every shadow, he wrote. Oh, so he was a real thinker, eh? The verdict. The jury of four men and eight women took one and a half days to reach a verdict of not guilty. It came in at 7.11pm on May 29th. In an unusual move, the jury asked Justice France to read out loud a note which said, We believe no one in the Nicholas family was involved in any way. Foreman was whisked from the court to a waiting car, saying only, I'm happy, I'm happy, I can't wait to see Shay, I haven't seen him in 18 months, and that was the first and last thing Foreman ever said publicly on the whole matter. Foreman declined through his lawyer, Leo Lafferty, to be interviewed for this article, and Lafferty said Foreman's life had been destroyed by the case. So we have to remember that this guy was found not guilty in the eyes of the law and by a jury of his peers. So we have to go to the fact that there is somebody out there who got away with murder who still needs to be caught. The Nicholas family were silent after the verdict was read. They left the courthouse silently together. Jack's brother Craig said he was shocked by the verdict and the fact that Foreman had walked free. He thanked police and Kingy for her great bravery in coming forward. Detective Sergeant Dan Foley said he was surprised by the verdict and he doubted police would be looking for anyone else in relation to Jack's murder. As far as the police are concerned, that is the end of the inquiry. We won't be taking the matter any further. So really the cops think it's him and that's it, obviously. Um, they don't think it was anybody else. They're not going to investigate to see if it was anybody else. Squire labelled the police investigation as shoddy and selective and said they had made the fatal mistake of picking an individual and making the case fit around them. They simply picked the wrong man and they should have shown it or should have known it long before they charged him. He said the verdict showed that Kingy had lied and in what could only be seen as a last dig at the Nicholas family he said if police ever reopened the case, they should look in rather obvious quarters for the person who was responsible for the shooting. After the trial, McVicker said it was unlikely any more rewards would be offered for information leading to convictions. Very sad. The final official proceeding related to Jack's murder was a coroner's hearing. 
A fairly perfunctory affair, it lasted all of six minutes and ended with Coroner Warwick Holmes saying that unless some extraordinary information caused the case to be reopened, the inquest would have to conclude that Jack died of gunshot wounds and that the matter would never be satisfactorily resolved. And for the family, that must be uh, so tough. Police had provided the coroner with a statement. It ended with no new evidence came to light during the trial and police are not looking for anyone else in respect of the murder. The gun that fired the shot that killed Jack has never been found. A police spokeswoman says the murder investigation remains open. However, police are not actively working on it and there are no current lines of inquiry to pursue. If we receive new information, we would assess it. No new information has come to light since the acquittal of the man who was before the court. Wow, guys. Uh, what a rough story for the family. And uh, for Mr. Foreman, if he is indeed innocent, and we have to remember he was found not guilty, uh, and he truly is not guilty, then this must have been awful for him as well. I don't know. I have a lot of feelings about this case. Uh, do you think that the police had just sort of one eye on this guy and... Uh, that's it they didn't sort of look anywhere else it was just this guy foreman and so they made a case around it made it fit um is it possible that this kingy lady was dishonest or making stuff up trying to get the reward we won't know that um she sounded pretty credible but you know she was a drug taker but i personally don't think that that you know that that matters that much um, and with the police saying that they are not looking at anybody else at all, it's, it's over, does that, that, does that mean that they actually really do think it was Foreman and it's just that the prosecution didn't have enough information or was able to prove that it was him behind a reasonable doubt in the court system? So, uh... Tell me what you think in the description box, uh, sorry, in the comments below, I really want to know. Um, just be uh, tactful, please, because, you know, the people in this story and the family might read the comments. Thank you for being with me. Remember, Crime Stoppers 0800 555 one. If you could help with a $3 uh, donation towards a new computer so I can actually bring you better videos <laughs> and use uh, the best you know applications on my uh, computer buymeacoffee.com slash nz mysteries please don't forget to like and subscribe it's a great way to support the channel uh thank you so much for being with me and i will see you in the next case